Sorry, assholes, your quiet day at the office is about to get severely fucked up. Guys, welcome back to the After Action Review. You know me, I'm Nick Guy, the world's most okay Green Beret. And back by popular demand, we have Ron Muller, absolute IC hitter, kind of breaks the stereotype in the mold of the intelligence community nerd. And you guys really responded well to the last episode. Uh, I'm finally tracking metrics and... That episode just knocked it out of the park with Spotify and iTunes listens. So, back by popular demand, Ron. Ron, thanks for coming back on. You're really welcome, and and thanks for the promo on Twitter this afternoon. I had to go go to the medicine cabinet and take another blue pill. Listen, I, when I say you're the originator, I'm being completely serious. Oh, big dick energy, kind of like, damn, that's a, that's a lot to live up to. It's, it's BDE, man. <laughs> I, I I know it's millennial talk. I know I know that's it's might as well be Arabic to your boomer ears. Stop, stop, stop. I I have I have children and I have grandchildren. I can get translators, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so. We left off, we, we, were, we were telling stories, we're definitely going to get back to the stories because they are amazing. I still want to know the story of the hat, but before we knew it last time, we really lost track of time, and I didn't want to keep Ron up to all hours of the night talking. Yeah, because so, the nursing home has, has rules, right? Yeah. It does. It does. Stop. It's, <laughs> Man, it's, it's got to be tough when your kids and grandkids can't visit you due to COVID nineteen. No, no, it's it's. We always have this rule. We already had this rule since day since our children turned eighteen, and we gave them a bus ticket out of town. Is a uh, at least one time zone away at all times. We are not the helicopter grandparents. <laughs> things like much to my daughter's chagrin, but actually, you know, we're close, but we don't have to be physically close, so it's all good. Man, you couldn't even spring for a plane ticket. They got school, you know, and, and you know, so, yeah. No, that's all right. They'll they'll be join, here when they join get the here. Army. Yeah, well, my son's in the Army. I know. Yeah, we talked about that. Yeah, so he, he joined the Army, and my, my daughter's a, a, a naval reservist and, uh, you know, corpsman, so. So she, is, is, she, is she, with being a naval reservist and a corpsman, is she at all at, I don't want to say at risk, but is there a possibility that she'll be deploying with the uh, hospital ships? No, I, I asked her about that. In fact, earlier today, good segue. And uh, she, yeah, she, uh, <laughs> she's actually, she's uh, lives near Gulfport, Mississippi, with her husband and and our, her three children, our three grandchildren, and um, she's attached to uh, the CB unit that's down in that neck of the woods. Okay. And um, so she, uh, you know, gets to wear all the cool, you know, cool things and show off her uh, expeditionary warfare, you know, surface or warfare pin. Yeah. Whatever. Everybody's got to, everybody's got to have bling. You know, that's, it's a, it's a service thing. Um, so no, so she's there, but if they do uh, start really uh, taking people from the Naval hospitals, she'll, she could uh, backfill those people that go there. And the thing that I don't think a lot of the, the people that realize that the activation of those two hospital ships, those former container ships, which are, are massively great capabilities that the U.S. has, but they take some regular uh, naval medical personnel, and then they take a lot of reservists, also medical personnel. Those reservists, those medical personnel, guess where they work when they're not doing Navy stuff? I'm guessing they're in the hospitals. They're in civilian health care system in hospitals. Yeah. So, you know, Rob and Peter to pay Paul. And uh, I guess, uh, you know, according to some of my sources in, in back in D.C., uh, 
you know, sec def inform the president and we'll kind of let them know that, you know, okay, we can do this, but here's, you know, here's, here's the uh, second and third order effects of this. And uh, I guess Governor Como, you know, got his way. So, but the ships in Norfolk in, in some sort of mechanical rehabilitation thing. So it's going to be at least a week before that gets back, you know, and then it's going to take a while to get everything situated to get going. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it seems, it almost seems draconian. I mean, like we send those ships off to like really bad places around the, around the globe. Oh, yeah. Like you can't, you don't even want to put medical personnel on the ground. So, I mean, I don't, like, so, you know, bring the patients there. I mean, I'm just seeing, like, you know, the optics of it. It's like some, it's like some apocalypse movie. Like that's where they're taking like the final stage victims <laughs> of I've seen the this Wuhan movie. flu. The strain. Wait, oh, hold on. I can't say that. That's problematic. It's problematic language. You can't okay, call the, it Wuhan the, flu. The Chicom flu. There we go. There it is. There yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. If, if Lord knows, if, if there's a Chinese person, you know, within five nautical miles of my location, you know, <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna be looking at this red dot pinning on his chest. So you know, <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, I have good feels of fire, and I have you know, I'm I'm good. <laughs> Just bring ammo, you know, <laughs> if you want to come stay with us. And no, I mean, I'm not those, a prepper, but, you know. Well, with those fields of fire, I can't afford the ammo necessary to shack up with you. Well, I mean, what, like, good, like 338, Lapua, Norma, like, I mean. You're supposed to be a good shot. I am a good shot. But that doesn't mean well, I want to spend a cheeseburger's worth of money on each individual round. Well, no, we'll just let them get in close, but we can, yeah. we can get them, we can sucker them in, you know. <laughs> just get a bunch of punji traps uh, set up. Oh God, no! Because the uh, the Black Hills is um, a lot of rock under the dirt, so we'd be out there with pick and <laughs> shovel doing doing penal penal work. No, not, not happening. Oh man! Anyway. All right, so so anyways, so last week we got sucked up into the stories, and then after we logged off or we we ended the the broadcast, we realized like there were there were a few topics that we wanted to talk about, we just ran out of time. Right. So I want, I want to talk about, because we had mentioned at the beginning of the last broadcast, um, you wanted to expound upon the two Marine Raiders who were carrying in northern Iraq. Right. Uh, and then I really want to hear about your thoughts on, on Mike Spann. Um, sure. and, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you know, at this point I used to be a cool guy, but now I'm just a nasty girl. Uh, Mike Spann was one of the first American, if not the first American, not first, the first American KIA in Afghanistan. Correct. Um, and I know a little bit about the story, but I'll let you you tell it as as the uh, subject matter expert. And you wanted to talk about Chapman as well, who was just recently awarded the Medal of Honor. That was that was, was he? No. Well, no, I'm talking about a uh, not not the Air Force Chapman. I'm talking about the uh, Army Green Beret uh, guy out of First Group. Uh, Nate, gotcha. Oh, Nate Chapman. Okay, absolutely. Right. right yeah. All right. Perfect. So, um, well, anyways, um, so the Raiders, the uh, I guess the uh, the dignified ret return of remains happened uh, earlier today or or yesterday. I saw I saw some social media posts about that. Of course, it's it's buried under you know everything else. Yeah. Um, and it's a damn shame. And you know the uh, you know they were they were killed. Um, in a, in a complex cave environment, or is it a cave complex? I'm there, you know, you know, I'm not a big spelunker. I hate caves. Uh, you know, it's not a, not a fun thing to do. I, I, I don't remember what the battle drill number is for that, but it's, it sucks. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm a amateur historian. You know, you can probably see some of the books behind me about half of them are, are history on, on warfare and, and battles and, you know things like that, and I'm I'm recalling the the battles of uh, in the Pacific and World War II, a lot of caves and a lot of bunkers and things like that. Sim similar type of environment in in that respect, and we 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 weren't we didn't go in do the tunnel rat thing. We um, you know threw in satchel charges, uh, you know reckless rifles. And my my all time favorite flamethrowers. Um, so it was you know it's it's a damn shame that we have to sacrifice 
highly trained, motivated Americans to go in into that. And then, of course, we had to, uh, I guess the, the CAG guys were the QRF, according to the media, and they had to go in to retrieve the bodies and, and complete the mission for all intents and purposes. And, and it, you know, again, that's what an extraordinary um, expenditure of precious national resources. And that really bothers me. You know, in, um, in 2006 uh, in Afghanistan, <laughs> I remember the general, the commanding general of 10th Mountain was, was really excited. And General Frankly, when he got excited, he, he got excited because usually he was pretty even keeled. But he was all excited because they'd just gotten a shipment of thermobaric hellfires. And he, he couldn't wait to employ them on, on the Haqqanis and, and the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda guys hiding in, in the caves up in the uh, Kunar and Nuristan and elsewhere. So, you know, again, we were trying to, you know, do the right thing in using our, our, our weapons to, uh, to take out the enemy without risking our own lives. But, yeah, it's a, it's a damn shame about the Raiders. I mean, they're a, they're a tremendously highly trained unit, motivated, and, and uh, it's just, you know, I mean, here's, here's two very experienced operators that get killed. And, you know, of course, the, the, the thing that kind of makes their sacrifice I guess the information on incomplete is all we heard was that they were involved in a raid on a, on a cave complex. We don't know, you know, not that I'm into body counts, but you know, what was, was this a command and control cave complex? Was it a, a supply depot? You know, was it, did they take out some major, you know, tactical geniuses, things like that? What, what's up? So. And, and you're right. I mean, there isn't a whole lot of information and kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, but kind of like combining, the the anecdote you just threw out with the the commanding general of the tenth mountain with the thermobaric uh, hellfires, hellfires and right. I should I should know I should as a JTAC know the nomenclature for that I want to say it's a Romeo too but don't quote me I'd have to pull up my smart book but why why are we <laughs> why why aren't we using weapon systems like that or you know f you know back in Afghanistan fuel air bombs were used to great success in cave complexes because it literally just sucks all of the oxygen right out, out of the complex you don't need to actually penetrate um but yeah why why aren't we using you know tools like that i when i had when i had jason on i had i had mentioned you know at least from where i stand i'd much rather spend treasure over blood in, in terms of something like that so unless unless it was like an HVI or an HVT that we really wanted information from, but we're not hearing any of that. That's not coming Correct. out. Correct. And, and, you know, we, we don't, it's not like we're, we're sending people to Gitmo or, or some of the other uh, select vacation spots run by the U S government throughout the world for further interviews, interrogations, whatever. So, I mean, that stopped a long time ago. So, yeah, Man. but you know, so, one of the things you, you talked about last time was the, uh, you know, this, you know, besides being, you know, the OGA series here is um, agency week or, or, you know, now working into week number two or part of week number two is you wanted to sort of record some of the, the stories of the GWAT before they, they disappear. And, and besides, we can't let the SEALs have all the, all the fun and glory. <laughs> so. No, no, let's, let's mix it up. And well, yeah, definitely. But, you know, the, uh, and then there's a lot of great stories and a lot, of, you know, a lot of things that, you know, would make funny little vignette movies type of thing. But it's, I think it's important to, uh, to remember and note some of the, some of the important casualties or, and, and every casualty we've had in the GWAT is, has been important and tragic, but, you know, there's a few that stand out in my mind. And one of them, of course, the first one, of course, is, is, is Mike Spann. Uh, my colleague in the agency, and I, I talked briefly about this in the Team House interview, but for for those of your, your listeners that are reticent to, uh, you know, give give Jack and Dave uh, a listen to, the uh, I only I only met Mike Spann once, um, and it was because I was transitioning from the Office of Military Affairs at the agency to Special Operations Group, and this is all in the immediate aftermath of 9/11. Um, he, uh, he was in an elevator with, uh, another, uh, ground branch officer and they were, <laughs> the elevator was full of tough boxes and Pelican cases full of gosh knows only what. 
and and Mike introduced himself. I introduced myself. He knew I was the I was the FNG in, in SOG. So you know, I really I I really appreciated the the, the warm welcome from from Mike. He was a, a you know a, a good teammate, good colleague in, in that brief you know five floor elevator ride. Um, and so fast forward to his um, his tragic uh, death there in the in the prison complex. Um, after after that all occurred, and there's there's some interesting video I think filmed by a German TV crew that showed some of it and parts of it. And, um, but and again, I've, I talked about this in an earlier interview with some with with you know uh, Jack and Dave. Is um, we had so now we have a. Uh, the first casualty in in the GWAT the, in in Afghanistan, and um, nobody knows how to get the body home. I mean, we've recovered the body, we've recovered the remains. The remains are now at, at Karshi Khanabad up in Uzbekistan, and we're trying to figure out how to get them home. And the only agency aircraft that we had available at the time, because you know I was an Air Branch guy, um, we couldn't we couldn't fit the the, the transfer case. In the thing, I mean, it it was it was a regular passenger door. You, you can't, you know, the it's like trying to move a couch type of thing, and you know, yeah. and it was hard. So we, I guess, the Air Force finally, you know, was able to get enough. You know, somebody finally embarrassed the heck out of the Air Force, and you know, got his remains transferred to uh, to Dover. And then the other thing was, this is shortly before I deployed to Afghanistan, is we had a memorial ceremony for. For Mike, in the in the dome there, the uh, the iconic dome outside of the original headquarters building at, at the agency, and his wife Shannon and uh, their daughters or his daughters, I guess. And I'm I don't know. It was it was a complicated family situation, and all I know is that everybody loved everybody and they all cared for everybody. Um, it was um, I wasn't ashamed to cry, and it was um, you know, and I and I don't think anybody should have been and and uh, you know, it was uh, it was it was a sad day because it really brought home the cost of the uh, of the conflict um, to to us to the agency family anyways that one of our own doing what he was trained and sent there to do um, you know tragically lost his life and it wasn't the first one um, somewhere in that same time frame again shortly before I deployed in Air Branch um, they were starting to send. Uh, other OGA teams into country besides the the one that 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 Mike Spann was on, and which was I guess for lack of a better nomenclature Alpha team. You know, so we started going through the alphabet, and um, we were getting um, augmented. These teams were being augmented by uh, special operations personnel with unique skill sets and things like that. So, and and one of these was uh, was Nate Chapman, who was an Echo from first group yes he was yeah yes and uh so he comes up to uh to air branch and and he sort of you know he, he shows himself up in my little cubicle and you know we're we're type of you know and i'm like trying to get deployed and trying to do all the other things that you know trying to help the guys out you know i'm not trying to be the nine thousand mile screwdriver but i'm trying to be helpful <laughs> without being <laughs> yes. without being annoying no, of course but so Nate shows up and it's really like a total eclipse of the sun because he's, he was a, a, a ginormous guy and, but very friendly. I mean, the, the, the dis, I mean, the disarming, you know, the, the little grin under the mustache and things like that. And he shook my hand and I'm, this is, I, I'll never forget this. I don't have large hands, but I don't think I have weenie hands either. But I mean, <laughs> This guy had ginormous grizzly paws, and he just enveloped my hand. But he didn't crush it or or play any, play any of those, you know, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna you know hurt you type of thing. You know, I'm gonna you know make you fall to your knees, crushing your your hand as I'm shaking it. I, he was a great, it was just a great guy. And then of course you know he he deploys with with the team, and and then he he gets killed in a in a very tragic. Um, and I'm not sure what kind of details I can tell, but it was just. It was tragic. I mean, he. Uh, I mean, it was. They got ambushed, and uh, he. I th his femoral artery, and it was. You know, as the guys were reacting to contact and trying to treat him, I mean, he bled out so quickly. It was. It was terrible. So, you know, and, and we honored him by naming our our base outside of coast. You know, Ch base Chapman. So. 
I mean, the, you know, those stories, you know, it's not the first time I've heard Chapman's story and, and, you know, there, there's plenty of, of open source information regarding him and Mike Spann. Right. Um, but you know, not, nothing going into like serious details regarding what, you know, what their mission was that it may, maybe a little bit with Mike Spann, you know, at, there was a lot of information going around, like how, how OGAs and ODAs were trying to court the Northern Alliance, things like that. But, right. you know, it's, it's hard to, it is, <clears throat> excuse me, it is hard to humanize, especially like the OGA guys, because even from a soft perspective, like when you get a cool OGA guy come in, um, you know, it, they are kind of superhuman. Like what, what's going on here? There's a lot of mystery surrounding them. There's a lot of intrigue, you know, and I, I think that makes a good company, man, too. Like, if you, you know, right. go somewhere and be the coolest guy that walks into the room. So with that comes that quality of the unknown. I do the same thing when, you know, I've worked with task force dudes or, or things like that. Like, right. you kind of just sit back and let them do their thing. But you have all these questions, but you don't want to ask them. Because right. all of a sudden, here I am thinking I'm pretty cool. And then somebody else just walks in and totally, you know, eliminates my cool guy status. So, you know, when it comes to stories like that, it, it, I think it is important. And, you know, God, I mean, how many more, how many more stars went up? on the memorial wall during the oh, G1. Gosh. Um, lots. I mean, and some of them weren't even G1 related. I mean, some of them were as, as tragic as a, as a, as a traffic accident in a, in a, but they were engaged in operational activities. So it was you know, terrible. Um, I mean, so I finally, I tell you another quick, another tragic loss that we suffered. Um, the uh, so I finally get out there to uh, Afghanistan and and I'm the I'm the air branch guy I'm and I'm kind of you know <laughs> I'm the lifeline back up to Uzbekistan and and the uh, all the deployed OGA teams and and sometimes they're co-located with the military a lot of times not um, for their supplies their water personnel you know whatever. And uh, so I'm a little I'm playing a little logistics, but also we're we're supporting them for combat missions, uh, you know, using the helicopter for, uh, you know, for you know, capture kills, that sort of thing, back when we were still doing all that. Um, so um, we, our aircraft comes in from Tashkent with the latest tranche of, of people. And by this time, you know, we're, we're starting to get a lot of uh, uh, agency uh, people who'd retired or had had left the agency short of retirement but had come back to volunteer for for the duration or, or for a set amount of con contractual time um, and one of them was a, a, a new agency employee um, by the name of, of Helga Boyce and um, that's a guy and so I'm no, I, I, because yeah. people yeah but you know and you can you can you can google and the Wikipedia thing is pretty pretty good on on him um but so he gets off the airplane with a bunch of the other people and and i introduce myself and welcome welcome to Kabul. of course we're at the airport and the airport at the time doesn't look like anything like it looks now it i mean we were literally uh we had a couple of uh, half eroded uh earthen revetments you know that the mud brick thing that's famous in afghanistan where we um i think we had uh three revetments two of them for the aircraft and uh, one of them, the logistics people had thrown a bunch of camo netting over and thinking it would keep out the rain or whatever. You know. <laughs> and a bunch of a bunch of pallets of supplies. And uh, and then all around us was uh, uh, berms and uh, just acres and acres of uh, destroyed, wrecked, abandoned Russian aircraft of you know pick your model type. It it was it was like something right out of a a, a bad you know apocalyptic movie type of thing. And, and of course, none of them had cool paint. They were all stripped clean. They were all silver, silver. But but hell, these people all get off and I do. And um, he asked a few good questions, and we chatted for a while. And and he seemed real engaging, intelligent. And a couple of days later, I, I put him on a, on a helicopter and, and took him out to uh, to one of the deployed teams out there. And they were working with local Afghans doing training. 
so here's the tragedy about it. So the supply supply chain still wasn't, you know, pumping out stuff left and right with uh, indigenous weapon systems and things like that. So, but the Afghans, smart people that they are, had uh, buried, cached a lot of uh, weapons, ammunition, uh, grenades, AKs, whatever. Um, and so we were digging those up or with the help of the Afghans who obviously knew where they, all that stuff was and um, using it. So they were out on a, on a, on a grenade range uh, practicing throwing grenades. Well, nobody really done a, 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 a quality check on the, uh, on their grenades. And I don't remember how long they had been buried, but uh, so um you know, they, the, the Afghans were throwing their grenades and as one guy's cocking his, his arm back to throw it, it, it explodes. He dies, Helga dies, and uh, another ground branch, a, a ground branch officer, because Helga was just a generic case officer, an operations officer. Um, a ground branch officer uh, got severely wounded. Um, so, you know, I'm sitting back in Kabul and all of a sudden, you know, you get the, you know, the, you know, the red alert type, you know, phone call or not phone call, but radio call. And, you know, it's, uh, so we got to go pick up, you know, the local, the Afghan guy, he's, he's local. So he's, he's taken care of, but got to go pick up the wounded, you know, uh, ground branch officer and, uh, get him up to Bagram. And, uh, and then we go back and, and we pick up, uh, Helga and, uh, the uh, yeah they uh, they didn't package him up too well it was um, and I this is gonna sound really I, I hate it this sounds sounds cold and impersonal but um, by the time we got him back and we got him up to Bagram to uh, for a more the proper dignified transfer by this time the Air Force had figured out how to do all that and taken people you know for both medevac onward to launch duel and and uh, remains onward to Dover and, and from there to their uh, place of burial. Um, the, uh, so the MI-17 lands and it's, I don't know, maybe 10, 11 o'clock at night, it's late. It's been a freaking ass long day. You know, you're working on adrenaline, Skittles and hate. And um, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, because they transferred um, a body and a wounded guy and, and things like that, um, the back of the MI-17 was, um, well, it wasn't its usual color. It was so we had to uh, get a bunch of buckets of water and uh, clean it out. And it, you know, you've seen the the movie, you know, the Mel Brooks movie or Mel Brooks, uh, Mel Gibson movie. Uh, you know, we were soldiers. Yeah. You know the the helicopter scene where they wash out the helicopter and it comes out, the water comes out red. Yeah, I I've seen that in real life and it it really uh, still gets you a little like Ugh. so. Uh, please advise your viewers before they, they listen to this that they may either have a stiff drink or don't eat anything that's you know, going to you know, come back up because it, it's pretty, it was, it was really graphic. And, it, you know, it, and for some of the, the, the agency officers that were around me, it, they didn't react well to it. And, uh, you know, I, I think I just sort of compartmented it. And uh, when I got home, I, I just talked to people about it because you need to talk about it. You, I can't just keep it inside. And that's helps me deal with it. Well, one, it's important to find the right people to talk about it. Definitely. Um, because how there, you can't, you can't really talk to your wife about something like that. You can't talk to your kids about something like that. You can, but they have no frame of reference in which to right. put that into context um and it brings up an important point i mean it's easy to get and I, i'm guilty of it too you know you see guys who are kia overseas especially now when my personal beliefs kind of well they don't kind of they definitely sit in the in the camp of why the hell are we still there but it's easy i i fall into the same trap of saying well you know they they died for the Republic or, you know, they died right. for their country. It's, it's, <clears throat> maybe it's a coping mechanism, maybe, especially when it comes from your community. Um, but that's, that's a really ugly side of war because it's either the rah, rah, 
you know, USA chant side or the very, very, you know, cold and jaded view of warfare. But the truth is, you know, it's just, right. It's, 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 it's an ugly business. It, and, it is. And especially, you know, <clears throat> you know, I don't, I have the benefit. I had the benefit of going to war with guys that had been going to war for decades. Um, which is another whole it, commentary there. <laughs> it is. But there is a benefit to that, as a, especially as a new guy learning the job, being thrown into a situation like that. It's good to have experience. Right. Early on in the war, you know, I mean, when was the last time the agency saw, th- you know, saw anything like that? I mean, you know, that, that's got to, it's got to be a system shock. It, it really was. Um I mean, we we had some retirees come back, and and when I'm retirees is is being kind. These these guys were the geriatric guys. I mean, they they'd been in Vietnam and they, you know, done all that sort of stuff. So like they the, like the Billy Waugh types. Yeah, and uh, yeah, he came out. He was he's he's quite the character. <laughs> I, he gave me his business card and everything like that. He says, "Come look me up." You know, he's he's a little like sparky guy. Yeah, he was. Uh, but yeah, we had some guy, and and a lot of them. Um, well, not a lot, but a good a good portion of them couldn't. I mean, everything was. They went back to their Vietnam frame of reference, and you know, it's not the same war. Every war is. I mean, every war has commonalities of tragedy and and humor, but obviously the the, the ground situation was was a lot different. So it was uh, it was hard to kind of you know get a seventy five year old guy to uh, you know like. Uh, let's let's refocus that that aperture of yours and and let's let's do it this way because no 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 those guys aren't mountain yards those those are hazaris you know <laughs> so <laughs> they don't you know, actually like you well actually the actually the hazaras did I mean you know the oh, wow. we uh, yeah we I got to, I got I was very fortunate um, we um, we had to go up to uh, up to Bamian where the Buddha's statues were and um, the right. uh, the ones that were the Taliban destroyed. Right. Yeah. Okay. Earlier, earlier in 01. So this was like, gosh, this was right before Anaconda. I think we, we went up there and we were looking to recruit indige forces for whatever. I don't, I was, I was, I was not the guy in charge, but um, so we land and the Hazars are, Obviously, they 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 don't look like real Afghans. I mean, they they look, you know. There's always the the, the famous folk tale rumor that they were uh, the the lost legion of Genghis Khan type of thing. So they have a very uh, Oriental look to them. So whether that's true or not, I don't know. But but very very cool people who you know, sort of like the Kurds in a way. They've uh, you know they've been put upon by all the other ethnic groups around them. Um, so the uh, the head guys go off to a meeting with the head Hazaras and things like, and so they got a few of us like, hey, what what are we going to do with these guys? Well, a couple of guys are pulling security to guard the helicopter, and um, making sure that our ride can take us back because it was through the mountain passes. It was it was it was exciting. Um, you know, <laughs> it was like damn, we're awfully close to that mountain. Um, but anyways, so, and you're looking at it from, you're looking out the back end and try not to look out the side windows because, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's something, There's you know. no sky. No, but, so they take us, they take us to the, uh, where the, where the, 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 the largest Buddha had been stationed. And um, I guess UNESCO had been there before us. I, I don't know when, but, because um, a lot of the larger remnants of the Buddhas were covered in giant, blue UN tarps with UNESCO written on them. And the Hazaras told us that they were, the, the UN wanted to rebuild the Buddhas. I'm going, yeah, this stuff is like sandstone. So I, you know, I don't think there's enough, you know, glue in the world that's going to you know, put it together. So I, I, of course I go, Hey, look, Elvis. And I grab a small little piece. You know, I, I, I did, I was a total, you know, jerk about, you know, stealing a piece of the Buddha, but I, I still have it. It's on my desk, so it's, it's indistinguishable for me. A rock, but what the heck? Yeah, it's a great and God, you know, who know I mean, what happened to those pieces? I mean, you can't really trust the UN to come through and oh, restore gosh, no. a world heritage site 
Like, yeah, I, I missed other opportunities to get out there when uh, I guess New Zealand had a, uh, had a, a small detachment out there doing their, uh, their winning hearts and minds and you know, civil, civil government training and things like that. Uh, I missed the opportunity to go out there. So I couldn't see what had happened, but I do remember. So they took us to where this was. And of course there's all the rubble and the hazards had sort of cleaned it up sort of like, you know, after the blitz or after the bombings in, in Germany in World War II, you know, the, the population, every, all, the, all the rubble was neatly piled together type of thing. So it was kind of, you know, so there was these three, you know, you know, large or, you know, large, mini, medium, and then smaller pile of rubble. But they took us to the opening and um, off to the side is an entrance and a, a very, uh, sketchy uh, stairway and all natural stone and very eroded through time and and some of the steps i, I think you had to have like a a 40 foot like leg thing because we were doing the uh it was like like running an o course um trying to scramble up things and you know with all our kit and crap on and banging and stuff like but we finally managed to get up to where the head was and there was maybe gosh i want to say you know, 18 inches not quite two feet wide um, pathway, you know, or in, uh, along the back side, so along the back wall, it's, you know, cut into the wall where you could walk to the other side and then through an opening and to the other Buddhas. So, and so the Hazar just across it, like, you know, he's a mountain goat and no big deal. He's done it a thousand times. And of course, we're all looking down at, I don't know, like, 60 plus feet going down you know, <laughs> and looking at looking at this thing it's not level it's kind of curved and it's round and we're like yeah no you know i'd like you know, <laughs> I, I really don't want my wife to get a telegram saying your husband died because he was stupid <laughs> hey and, man did you hear about ron yeah, yeah man he was killed was it totally badass no man no, <laughs> he, he no, died really. sightseeing yeah exactly exactly <laughs> Yeah, I would have. I would have been bad. So we. Uh, oh man. Yeah. So we. Um, we 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 politely declined, but uh, it was. Uh, yeah, it was just. You know, I mean, to think about the the Buddha that had been in in that. You know, niche in the in the in the mountainside, and then the engineering that had gone into it and, and things like it was. It's still impressive, and of course, going down through that stairwell was even more impressive. So. You know, <laughs> slip slide, don't be last. So I was kind of, but it was, it was fun. Man, see, those are, the, see, these are the stories that I want to hear. These are, you know, these are stories that are totally outside the realm of the the DOD. Like maybe, maybe a couple of high-end units doing some secret squirrel things. But, you know, most people's Afghanistan experiences do not mirror, oh, let's go do, uh, key leader engagement at this you know one of the one of the world's holy sites like that it doesn't right. happen so i mean that's that's really cool right yeah i mean it was i guess during the 60s a lot of um, you know western european u.s hippies flower children whatever that was sort of the the pathway to india and they they would go there and they would what, whatever hippies and free love children did back then and i'm sure the Afghans <laughs> had, a, had a like a you okay you're you're having fun would you like to do it with my goat too you know, I'm, I'm kidding i'm kidding i'm kidding i have i have a lot of respect for the hazaras they uh they're awesome people but they really oh, they really get they really get the shaft every every time so man see that's crazy though i mean that's these are the these are the stories yep so i mean Besides, I mean, okay. So we 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 last week we covered, you know, the funny side. We covered, you know, we covered some of the the serious things. It's been it's been on my mind. It's been burning me. I I want to know the story behind the hat. Just a hat. It's not just a hat. That's oh, the tally well, bar. Okay, the tally bar. Yeah. Okay, the town, the, the famous, the world famous tally bar, the most exclusive bar in all of Kabul and maybe all of the world. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's as the agency doesn't have to follow general order number one. So we uh, and um, which some agency officers um, do to excess, which is you know tragic, and they end up you know flying home quickly short of tour and uh sobering up sobering up on the way going gee will i have a job when i get back type of thing um but the, the 
the tally bar was uh, was established in the um, in the building where the uh, the station was established, and um, the um, so they had a little old like bar structure thing, and and it was it was it was a lot like a like a team house bar or like a a, a marine house bar at round embassies type of thing, um, because we were in Kabul, which back in late 01, early 02, looked a lot like Stalingrad with the uh, the, the way the buildings had all been destroyed. Um, the interior walls of this particular room were uh, covered with plywood. And um, the, the tradition began, um, and it was had already been established by the time I got there in, in late January of 02, that um, people would write a, a sentiment or you know a little catchy saying or whatever on on the uh, on the on the plywood and people would normally do that right before they left because you know that was it was just it was cool so you kind of walk around um, uh, sort of like the nerd at the high school dance trying to walk around not not being obvious and call everybody because you're the new guy in the in 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 the in the station building there and you're kind of reading all the sayings of who's who and what's what and things like that. And you're trying to think about, oh, what am I gonna write when I when I get to that point? Um, but I mean, and we had a lot of a lot of tear guys come through there too. So uh, uh, Neil Roberts had had come through, and uh, he uh, he had written some something up there, uh, but you know, obviously before he passed during Anaconda. You know, but uh, it was so you know there was you know, things people wrote on there that were kind of like oh you know gosh you always were an asshole I guess you still are and other people were like who's this again because it was almost like people were using camp names sometimes they you know it was like I really don't know who this is oh that's so and so I go why don't they just say it it's not like it's not like you know we're gonna this is gonna be open to the public and um, through future tours going through there. Um, it was fun. The uh, the plywood walls had um, the room got a lot smaller because they kept adding plywood walls on top of the old plywood walls because more people were going flowing through station and things like that. So they wanted to uh, everybody wanted to write on there. Of course, I made the uh, the comment. I said, I hope we're taking the plywood walls, the the older ones, and sending them to the agency's museum because I mean, that's part of agency lore and history. And uh, that seems like a no-brainer, to be honest. Well, the, the agency the agency has a, a a couple of wonderful historians, but you know, they're everything's classified, everything's secure. We we can't we can't share anything. Although the agency has a, a, a small museum, and um, a couple of the hallways in the in the agency headquarters building are, you know, their office offices on either side of the hallway. But you go through the hallway, and it's like you're walking through a, a museum piece and. And they would change the displays occasionally, things like that. Of course, you know they they brought the original helicopter and it's it's static displayed outside in at, at Langley now there and at the agency headquarters, and a great aircraft. Um, but I don't I don't know if they ever brought those plywood walls because I I know my stuff's probably fourteen layers back in there. <laughs> Barely, you know, because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna write every time I came through there. That was just you know like. Well, Oh, no, it's him that would, again. That'd totally not be cool. No, so yeah, whatever. And but it was, um, yeah, it was kind of, it was, it was, it was a great little uh, relief valve for us. Um, and most of us were pretty mature enough and cognizant enough that you really don't want to get shit faced in a war zone because it's not the not the best place to do that. Although a couple times people came back from a, a mission that had gone not well and um everybody gave them their space and uh, there's a bottle of jack daniels in front of them or whatever their poison was and off they went so and they it, it was it was all it was all good but uh yeah it was uh it's a great little bar i mean the uh, the agencies and the tories for establishing great little bars in the war zones i mean in baghdad we uh we created the uh, the Babylon bar, you know, a play on words. Yeah, it was <laughs> whatever, and um, and it was it was okay. And then of course um, this one here, um, Putty's Putty's Pub in Sulaymaniyah, Iraq, uh, at the at the base, the the agency's base in Sulaymaniyah, um, and it was named after uh, 
uh, a contractor who who died and um, his nickname was putty but it's you know even though we're post st patty's day this is my only close enough irish shirt so and i i figure since we're doing one one theater bar we'll do another theater's bar so we we're, we're good <laughs> That's it's equal opportunity representation. That's all. always yeah. And I have no idea what we're doing in Yemen or or in Mali or God knows where. But so. Uh, well, I hope. I mean, I hope the tradition. Well, I, has, I'm sure it is because I <laughs> I remember going through the farm, you know, and and this was you know back in the late '80s. So, you know, you know where the classes are now in the in the 200s. My class was 30. So yeah. So it was. Um, I don't want to say that it was a lot more elite because that sounds snobby. No, you can go ahead and say it. No, I really don't because not every, not, believe me, there. I was in the middle of that bell curve, and there was some people anchoring that bell curve, and and uh, so we. But uh, it was, you know, and I went through the the military version MOTSI, which is now combined with the agency's field training course. Uh, so the agency had thirty people, and we had thirty people, and our our the agency course started a week ahead of us. And the reason for that was because um, the instructor that taught you, you know, flaps and seals, back when we were still doing flaps and seals on envelopes and cool stuff like that, the uh, that instructor would have to the next week would teach us there. We the uh, the facilities didn't allow for for uh, cross contamination with with the agency toads at the time, uh, as far as classes go. No, that's all right. They, it was it was it was a it was some sort of weird DoD agency agreement at the time, but. Uh, but anyways, yeah, we uh, we went through the course, you know, 30 of us, and now they're they're sending 200 200 or so through, and it's wow, it's it's amazing. And of course, the facilities completely expanded. But but one instructor there, and the instructors, a lot of them were old Vietnam, uh, Operation Phoenix, uh, the Phoenix program, uh, Southeast Asia, um, Africa, the Congo, the original the Congo with you know with yeah, with yeah. So the um, and one guy was there, and I swear he had he had the best aftershave. I couldn't tell if it was Jim Beam or Jack Daniels, but he was, <laughs> you know, I, I guess he was he was quite the alcoholic, and he wasn't that good of an instructor either. But yeah, <laughs> but we all had we all had to cheese up to him because you know, that one block of instruction. He was he was the guy in charge, and you know you don't want to have a you are a no go at the station because there was no. Um, you're gonna you're gonna be able to redo this block of instruction because you're not gonna wait around another six months for that. You're you either retest or or re, or, or press onward. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It's it was it was a very zero defect ment or thing. So and the interest. So all thirty of us graduated, which was um, kind of unique. Um, but uh, not everybody walked out of there certified to operate so so it was kind of one of those we're, we're going to set this great record of you know we graduated all 30 people yeah but only 22 of them are certified so yeah <laughs> and of course we never knew who who wasn't who you know i know i was certified because i was going to an operational unit so it was i the rest of the people you sort of lose track of those people they don't rate they don't and they don't. And so, what happens if they if they came out of the they, you know they graduated but they weren't certified? What would they do? Just go well, if they a, a if wing? they were well, if they were active duty military personnel because we had all all the services there, they would go back to a, a generic unit. If if they were MI or CI, they would go back to that. If they if they weren't, they'd go back to whatever they were before. You know, food services, whatever. Um, if they were a civilian employee. Well, graduating and certifying is a condition of employment. So th thank you, thank you for your time and attendance. Here's your NDA. See you, bye. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah, it was harsh. So all right, so then yeah, this poor sap goes up to like Merrill Lynch or Bear Stearns, and they're asking. We see we see a six month gap in your resume. A break in employment in your resume. Care to comment on that? Nope. <laughs> well, it's it's it's. I'm sure they were given some sort of cover story to to uh, to bullshit employers. I, I hope so. I mean, wow. I mean, like, you know, you hear but, stories yeah. of like guys that don't 
that that performed well like during the long walk right and they just like had a bad day towards the end or something and because they can afford to be super picky like one bad day and you're done they at least get they at least give you like a certificate that says that like you've completed an advanced land navigation course so you have something (laughs) to show for it like they offer or they say well you we, we're not gonna put you in ops but we'll put you in support which i'm sorry I, that's fine with me i mean just to be associated with those guys would be too cool for school i mean yeah well yeah, yeah i mean support, yeah, support's yeah, kind of for, broad. yeah for 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 that organization like that's right cool. oh yeah 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 for, i mean yeah. their support organization is awesome like mm-hmm. like you hear stories of like direct support dudes who just, you know, they're, you know, they're right there in the action because, exactly. you know, they perform critical communications or dog handling services, things like that. Now, in terms of white side soft, that's what they've started to do with the, with uh, SFAS and the Q course with 18 x race. Right. And if it used to be because you were a tr- like, if you were an 18 x ray, you'd go through boot camp, you go through, Infantry, one station unit training, you go to airborne school, you go off. If you, if you don't make it, you get assigned to the 82nd, the 173rd, or the 25th ID. One of the three airborne right. units as an infantryman. Right. That changed like two and a half, three, yeah, maybe four years ago. They were reclassing 18 x-rays and sending them back to AIT to, to learn an MOS that would be – that you know one of the groups needed in supports they train you to be like a 25 series right critical needs of the army exactly it wasn't so much the needs of the army it was the needs of the special forces regiment right and that created a little bit of an issue like i'd go down like to the like to the six shop because i'm Mm -hmm. I'm an echo so like i'd have to go down to the six shop and usually i had a great rapport i had a i had you know what i didn't have a great rapport i had an excellent rapport with the 25 series down there. We, I deployed with a bunch of them. They were great kids. They were super young. They were super motivated. Um, they loved the fact that they, you know, were doing cool guy things. Like they understood like, wow, I got lucky. I'm in group. Right. Um, and they were a pleasure to work with. And, you know, it's easy. It's, you know, being an SF guy, you need to know how to build relationships. So if they did you a favor, it's too easy to, you know, toss them a case of beer or something, you know, like it's, return the favor always. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, God, I, I did so, I got so much stuff done just by buying cheap beer for. Save the good kids. stuff for yourself. I got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, come on now. I'm not, I'm not about to drop, you know, 15 bucks on a sixer for, you know, for somebody that's not me. I like to think I'm a good person, but I'm not a great person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but, you know. That kind of changed when we started getting like support kids who were they were either non selects or they were they were selected and things didn't work out in the Q course. Right. And they came they came into group chip on their shoulder. Massive chip on their shoulder. And they just they didn't understand like how this worked. They didn't under, they didn't understand it one bit. Like it was I walked in, I walked into the six shop and God, I needed. I was trying to. What the hell? I don't even remember what I needed. It doesn't. It doesn't matter what I needed. I went in. I asked. I, I said hello to my buddies. They were all busy doing projects, so they were like, "Hey, uh, Specialist Smith is new here. He's not working on anything. You can go over to him." So I'm like, "Hey, man, like, how's it going?" And right off the bat, attitude. And I'm like, "Hey, so I kind of need a favor." I know it's, you know, it's not technically in your realm of responsibilities, but I need a favor from you. <laughs> like, I think I need, like, some images on a hard drive or something. Like, it, it would have taken 20 minutes of his day. You're speaking all- Russian to him. <laughs> he wasn't understanding a thing you said. Favor from you? No, it's not in my, not in my wheelhouse. No, it, and it wasn't. And he goes, uh, that's not my job. And I go, well, yeah, but, you know. You, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. And he goes, I don't want you to scratch my back. And that was it. He like turned oh. away. And because I'm an, because I'm an x-ray, I don't know how to, I don't know how to army. Like, I don't know how to be an NCO. Like I I am an NCO, but I'm not an NCO. Right. No, I, I like, know that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you got some salty E6, E7 type who grew up in the army. He would have handled it differently. I was like snap to a parade rest, dude. Yeah, when yeah seriously. How about you go to parade rest? 
and do what I tell you to do because I'm a staff sergeant and you're a specialist. No, no. You're trying you know, to be, fake, you're trying to be staff, a nice guy. Yeah, yeah, fake staff sergeant guy goes, huh, this phone is temporarily out of service. Hang up and try your call again later. And that's what I did. <laughs> but guess what, Ron? It did not work. Yeah, no, I, I get that. That's... Eventually, they learn from their shop. Like, their, their NCOs eventually, once they get their hands on them and say, you know, okay, you know, this is how things work. It's even worse in the SIG debt. But the SIG debt is an awful place. Right. We don't talk. The SIG, the SIG debt is where they send the 18 Echoes that don't fit in on a team. Oh, God. Like they're not team guys. Like, they graduate the Q course, but they're not team guys. They go to really... SIG debt. So they barely made it through Max Gain. Well, I'm not going to say that because I barely made it through Max Gain. Wow. Yeah. So what? Well, it's, this is a, it's a good story. This this is actually a good story. So Max Gain, I went. It was God. It was a miserable. It was a miserable ten days to be outside. It was it was right before holiday block leave. So we were like in early December. And for whatever reason, this this December in North Carolina was brutal. It was 33 degrees, so it was just warm enough not to, you know, snow, but it was right. just freezing rain. And for you guys that don't know, Max Gain is the final FTX in the Echo Course portion of the Q Course. It is a 10-day suck fest where you walk <laughs> around and you, you land nav to different points that, to make different radio shots. And at every point you have to make an HF shot, which, you know, consists of building an antenna, you know, cut your jungle antennas. Yeah. Not even a junk. Like we're talking like real antennas, like jungle antennas, that's your line of sight. Or your Yaggies and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So you got your, your Yaggies or your, your Yaggies, you know, depending on, on who you ask, you got your, your inverted V's, you got your, your, your dipoles. You you got basically, Oh God, now I'm, See, I can nerd out about HF. I love HF. Um, so does my son. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. He's he's a big HF guy. I, I love HF. It's it's and I I think it's super cool because it's such old school tech and it just it, it and it works, works. It works so well. Yep. It does. Um, I mean, you have to be an organization that's equipped to handle it because the tech is so old. Like the regular army doesn't. Re- they they still have HF antennas or I'm sorry HF radios in their inventory, but they really don't use them. Well, they don't know how to use them. And that's the thing. Like, I've talked to, like, i talked to, to conventional radio guys, and I'm like, hey, you guys have, like, these – you guys got these 150s. Like, do you guys – have you guys ever used these 150s? And they're like, no. I'm like <laughs> – they're like, we use these 119s. I say, get that trash out of here. <laughs> but uh, – Anyways, but, go ahead. Anyways, You're hurting so, out. So it's, it's a total suck fest. You know, your ruck weighs 130 pounds. It is it, – for, for 10 days you're out in the field. And for 10 days, it just, it was freezing rain. It was so cold that we were doubling up in sleeping bags. Like you, you're with a small group, but you have a partner. And that's your partner that helps you build your antenna, make the shot. So at every location, you do an HF shot, you do a SATCOM shot. SATCOM shot, super easy. There's no reason to miss a shot. HF, I think you're allowed to miss two shots. Um, and we were shooting to two different locations, which was unusual in the course. They either, they either you know, have you shoot to the west coast um or they have you shoot down to tampa Mm -hmm. um and the radio that they give you and i'm not going to talk in depth about this radio because it is a classified system but the the radio is designed to to it will eventually push traffic no matter right no matter what kind of antenna no matter how crappy of an antenna you built you could you could hook this radio up to a chain link fence or you could drive a nail into a sap vein in a, in, a, in a pine tree and use the sap vein as an antenna. That, that, that radio will eventually tune itself to whatever mm-hmm. you're using as an antenna. The problem is, is you have a window. You have a one-hour comms window with a right. radio that is literally designed to load traffic via a laptop, right? hook it up to the antenna, bury it and forget about it, and then just let it do its thing, and it will send the message. It will receive messages, and then you go back, you unbury it from its secret location, plug in your laptop and you retrieve the message. That's what it was designed to do. So in max gain, you're basically the, the cards are already stacked against you <laughs> um, because now you're using a radio in the way it wasn't designed to be used. So you had, you had to cut a perfect antenna if you wanted to make the shot. 
last shot, I'd already, we'd already missed one shot. It, the, 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 I mean, I, I'm not going to make excuses. The weather, the weather was crappy. Um, it, it got so bad that we as a team were carrying around a generator because we couldn't charge our batteries with solar panels. And no matter how much hand cranking we did, like we couldn't replenish batteries. So the cadre brought out generators to every team and then the, the teams had to carry the generators around. It was <laughs> awful. Like, so you have 130 pounds on your back. You have a, a you know, you have a, a dummy rifle, you got a rubber ducky. And now, you know, you have a 300 pound generator that you're lugging through the woods. It was, it was a total clown show, but anyways, plus, plus the fuel for the generator. Plus the fuel. Well, you know what we were, they were bringing us fuel. Okay. They were, so they were nice enough. Well, you got I know, easy. I know. First easy class, first easy class. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, so we already missed one shot. It was, it was one of those things like the mess, the traffic didn't push. We get back, we're making our final shots. It is, you know, the final shot, they bring everybody back in to like the same area so they can get accountability. And the thing was what we call an antenna farm. Like there were just the antennas strung up in trees every which way. <laughs> and the way these antennas work is they're super directional. So like if you are shooting into another antenna, like your RF energy is going to interfere with that. And it was just a mess. So we think we get the shot off. All right. So then the our the cadre tell us, hey, delete all message traffic, delete everything from your computers. We're going back. And then they're gonna tell you what shots you miss and whether or not you have to if you made it or not. So you're allowed you maybe we missed two shots and you couldn't miss three. That that's what it was. So okay. we missed two out of like up to this point, like twenty. And <laughs> so we get back and they go, guy, and we'll say Smith. Three missed HF shots. And I go, no. I go, no, we sent traffic on that last one. I know we did. We, 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 we have the readout. And, you know, and then during, during it, you we were supposed to take screenshots of, like, sent message traffic, like, combinations right. to, to prove. Um, but then, you know, when we were leaving the antenna farm, they said, hey, delete this trap. You know, delete all your screenshots. So I told my roommate, like, or my, my partner, I was like, hey, I'll, I'll break down the antenna. You you know, delete all the, all the data. Well, the idiot, thank God he was an idiot because he saved our ass. He forgot to delete the screenshot. So we're like, no, we pushed that. We pushed that traffic. We got confirmation and they go, well, you can't prove it. And then my partner goes, I forgot to delete all the screenshots. Oops. So, <laughs> yeah. But they're like, are you kidding me? Can you not listen to simple instructions, but bring us the screenshots. So, like we're standing out there 10 days in the field. You were just soaking wet. You were just muddy. I was, it was awful. I just got done sharing a sleeping bag with this dude. Cause you only get about an hour sleep at right. a time. You get like two, one hour windows of sleep a day. I am miserable. And now he and I are standing tall outside the cadre shack at the old echo compound. Mm -hmm. And, um, they're reviewing this data and they come out and they say, God damn it guy. It is your lucky day. He goes, your partner's stupidity saved your ass. I go, so the shot went through. They go, the shot went through. The turkey didn't, the, the turkey is the, the base station. Right, right. Um, he goes, the turkey didn't pick it up. It didn't register it, but your screenshot proves. So I almost did not pass Max wow. Gain. And that I did not want to go back through. <laughs> um, I did not want to go back through because I would have had to, re, you know, Re, you know, recycle to a, another class and pick back up. And now I can, I can say I was one of the last hard classes because now max gain is only five days in the field and they got smart and they, now they do five days of like setting up a talk with like SDNs and computers and things like that. Like stuff that you're actually going to do on a special force deployment. Ask me how many times, ask me how many HF shots I did in the desert with, you know, Zero, zero groundwater and nothing to hang a uh, antenna up. Almost none. In fact, okay. none. So, you know, they got smart with with how they train guys, but Max Gain lost a lot of the uh, luster, a lot of the appeal, the the final gut check. Right. That was a point of pride for Echoes. Like everybody does, every MOS has their FTX. The well, Max Gain is, is the hardest. It is hands down yeah. the hardest. Yeah, I mean, it's, it really sets you up for Sage.
So yeah, it, it really does. Because Sage, if, Sage, you know, if if you have a good team, the comms package can be, you know, can be it can be good. So, yep. Oh, uh, Ron, thanks for coming back on, brother. You're welcome. I mean, I'm I I have to I have to cut it short, unfortunately. But anytime you want to come back on, you just let me know. We make it happen. All right. Well, I'm really looking forward to uh, your next interview with uh, one of the original CAG uh, gentlemen, the Mike the, Viney, the, the, the Quiet Warrior. I mean, you 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 look at him going, oh, "This guy's not harmful. He's 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 a pushover. Not nope. not nope. at all. Oh man, not at all. That'll be tomorrow night. So yeah, that'll Ron, be that'll be so great. Thanks so much, brother. You're welcome. All right, take it easy. Take it easy.